quick point I want to insert here is that we know this through the, the evidence-based neuroscience research by the way that we scan the brain. Blood flow is working to all parts of the brain. You actually use all of your brain all of the time. So a neuro myth is you only use 10% of the capacity of your brain. That's actually quite wrong. We're actually using all of our brain all of the time, no matter what we're doing. But we tend to send more resources to places that are being used more if that makes sense. So if I'm in a fearful state and I'm engaged in this part of the brain, then blood flow will be dominating to this part of the brain and my external behaviors will be determined by where the blood flow is going in the brain, if that makes sense. So if I'm actually using these lower two regions of the brain, then I'm in what I call my red zone. And that means simply that more of my resources are available to this part of the brain because I'm using this very strongly right now. Again, if we take a scan of someone's brain when they're in a fearful state, in a stress state, then this is where we see a lot of the activity in the brain going. What we see in this part of the brain is a focus on me. and We have low awareness. And also low choice. In other words, I'm in a lower state where I can see what's available to me in terms of the choices I can make and I, I am not aware of um, the impact of my emotional state on others or it's lower than it might normally be and the focus of my behavior is very much about me. So an example of this is a two-year-old tantrum. And this makes sense because you can see that two-year-olds are very much operating in this part of the world. But sometimes as we grow, we keep the habits of two-year-old tantrums and they change and modify over the years. But ultimately, these behaviors are still focused on us. We are low in awareness of the impact of this behavior on others and we don't really have a choice in it. So when we're at our worst, we are in this part of the brain. When we start to engage with the limbic and the cortical brains together, then we are in what we call our blue zone. And in the blue zone, we have availability of our decisions, our, our memory and our learning and our emotions in combination with the thinking, the rationale, language and the executive control. This is a very mindful state. So we can be aware of our emotions. We can be aware of the impact of our emotions on others. We can make some modification of our behavior or our choices. And our focus is on you or we instead of me. The awareness is higher. And our choices are more available. We have more choices available. And just to exemplify this, we don't necessarily need to be in a happy state. This is not happy versus sad. This is not good versus evil. This is all about me, all about you. Low awareness, high awareness. Low choice, high choice. So I could be in a relatively um, unhappy mood, if I can put it that way, but still be focused on us or you, and I can have high awareness and I can make better choices. This is where the executive control of the prefrontal cortex really comes into play, where we can make a choice that's actually better for someone else than ourselves. We know that young children can't do that, but as they get older and as they develop, and if they develop well, then their capacity to do this actually increases over time. Uh, lots of stories I could bring to bear on this particular piece, but if I just finish with one example of, of how these two pieces of, um, of zone of, of development or zone of activity are occurring. If I'm driving to the airport, and what triggers me when I'm going to the airport uh, in terms of stress and fear is the fear of missing a plane fear of missing a flight. So if I'm driving to an airport and I know I'm already late, then I'm in a relatively stressed state. However, if I'm in a poor um, brain state, I'm low on sleep, low on available resources like um, glucose and oxygen, I may not be all that fit, I may not be breathing well, and I may actually be a little bit sick, then my brain's going to default to what's easiest, this part of the brain. 
if someone wants to merge into my lane as I'm driving forward, then I'm, if I'm in this particular state, I'll close that opportunity out. I'll drive and close the space. And if that person continues to try and push in, then I'll attach my fear uh, and that may convert into some anger. Uh, I'll attach that fear to them. And so therefore I'll start to get quite angry with this particular person, with this driver, and my awareness drops right back and I zone in, my vision zones in on the cause of this anger. And therefore I'll, I'll start to get quite annoyed, quite angry, and I may start to say things and do things that I may not normally do in, in everyday activity. So I might start to um, say some things that others might find embarrassing or inappropriate. Uh, I'm having low choice. And it's all about me. You've taken my space. I'm trying to get to the airport. Get out of my way. And this is where we see road rage occurring. However, if I've used mindfulness training over a period of time, maybe I've meditated. Me meditation builds this awareness piece very, very strongly. It's a new muscle in the brain. I can be aware of my emotional state and I can acknowledge that to myself. And I can say, I know I'm in a, a, a stressed state. That's my problem. I can't change the traffic. And this person who wants to come into my lane in front of me, that's probably not going to make me very much later at all. So how about I just drop back, let them come into the space, stay in a calm state as much as I can. So yes, I'm still stressed, but I'm going to let them in. So I've made a choice for them and for the larger system of traffic, in fact, because I've been less dangerous. So I've made a choice that's available to me because I'm more aware and I'm using awareness and I'm actually calling out my emotions. I'm using language to uh, call out what my emotions are and acknowledge them. Now that takes a bit more effort, um, but actually over time, interestingly, the effort falls away, the cost falls away when I do things like mindfulness training over a period of time. So hopefully that demonstrates, first of all, the difference between the red and blue zones and the difference in, a, in an everyday sense of how if you are in your best space, you do the right thing for other people. You can be excessively happy in this space. You can be, this is where you need to be if you want to be creative. This is where you are collaborative. You're socially oriented. You can learn from mistakes. You can acknowledge mistakes. Bosses who approach mistakes from this angle help people learn from their mistakes. Bosses and leaders who approach mistakes from the red zone hold people accountable to punishment, into fear. How dare you make them this mistake? And no learning can occur from that. So you can start to see that a simple model of what is a massively complex organ can help us start to understand what, where we are when we're at our best and where we are when we're at our worst based on where the blood is flowing and uh, where, the, where the brain activity is occurring. A final point, if you want to remain in this place, then get some good sleep, stay hydrated, eat well, um, eat, as some people say, real food, food made by humans rather than machines, exercise regularly, and exercise the brain activity of being mindful. And if you, if you do all of those things, not all of the time, but most of the time, then what you're actually doing is creating more of these pathways on a day-by-day -day basis to be able to stay more in this part of the brain than here.